your attention, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, all physically attending here or watching us online. It's day three of Web 2023. I am Marine PhD student Afra Hal Uthman. And every day I want to tell you that we have exciting and inspiring talks, workshops, and events to share with you. So I hope you're all enjoying and benefiting from the web activities around campus so far. Today, we are going to have an inspiring, distinguished lecture by distinguished speaker Holly Moss about rethinking neurodiversity. The talk is going to be one hour long between the talk and the questions. 15 minutes at the end of the talk will be dedicated to the questions. Those who are joining us online, please, you can send your questions in writing. There is a special feature is provided for those who prefer to enjoy the talk in Arabic language. There will be an interpreter in Arabic, and you can collect the translation unit for that purpose from outside the auditorium. Just a kind reminder, please, to return the units at the end of the talk. For now, I would like to present our moderator for this special session, Dr. Ball O'Callaghan, who is a clinical lead for the new family and a child support center in KAUST. And also, he is a child psychologist in KAUST. Let's welcome him, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and welcome to those who are joining us online. I'm so pleased to be introducing Haley Moss, who will, who will deliver this evening's distinguished lecture entitled Rethinking Neurodiversity. Haley was diagnosed with autism at the age of three, and her parents were told that she might not even finish high school or earn a driver's license. Today, she is a lawyer, a neurodiversity expert, a keynote speaker, an educator, and the author of four books that guide neurodivergent individuals through professional and personal challenges. Haley is a consultant to corporations and nonprofits that seek her guidance in creating a diverse workplace and a commentator on disability rights and the Americans with Disabilities Act. The first openly autistic lawyer in Florida, Haley's books include Great Minds Think Differently, Neurodiversity for Lawyers and Other Professionals, the Young Autistic Adults Independence Handbook, and a Freshman Survival Guide for College Students with Autism Spectrum Disorders. Haley earned her law degree from the University of Miami School of Law and was admitted to the Florida Bar in 2019. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the American Bar Asso Association Solo, Small Firm, and the General Practice Division's Breaking Barriers Award 2020, D30 Disability Impact List 2021. She lives in Miami, Florida, and is a fan of young adult fiction, Taylor Swift, drawing and painting, and video games. So on behalf of KAUST, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Haley Moss. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and for the opportunity to get to be here with all of you to learn and to grow and to think about neurodiversity. I love getting to do whatever I can to make it more inclusive. So as you heard, there is translation and stuff available to you as well. So I do want to make sure that we have plenty of time to have a discussion with each other and also have time for questions. So I'm going to do my best to be mindful of the time that we have. And to do that, we're just gonna get started right away with talking about what neurodiversity is. I am aware this is a word that might be new to many people. It was new to me actually when I was a college student myself. When I was in university, I heard of neurodiversity for the first time. And that very first time I thought it was a made up word. I thought it was funny that it sounded kind of like a couple different things smushed together, brains and differences, which is exactly what it is is that when we talk about neurodiversity, we're talking about how every single one of us has a different brain. We all think, process, and experience the world in different ways based on how our brains work. And that's just a 
typical thing to be expecting in our world. The way that sometimes I like to describe this is imagine being in that auditorium that you're in right now. And some of you might think it's really warm and some of you might think it's really cold in there. And neither of you is right or wrong. It's just how your body is experiencing that room. You're not wrong if you're the person sweating when everybody else is cold or if you're the one who's shivering that you're the one who's wrong while everyone else is sweating, for instance, and they're warm. It's all about how your body is taking in information, whether it's through your senses, whether it's through how you're working through a problem or how you're communicating. Every single one of us is part of a neurodiverse group. And when we look at it in that way, we have people who are neurotypical, which is the majority of us, people whose brains work in the ways that we're expecting them to, in line with what our society thinks is normal. I try not to say normal too much because I really don't know what normal is. I don't know if anybody here does either. Normal is not something any of us really hope to become someday. All of us want to be talented, unique, different, important, famous, accomplished. Nobody's goal really is to be normal, which is why I think it's really funny when neurodivergent people or those in the minority are expected to often achieve this neurotypical social and cultural norm that our goal isn't really to be normal but when you are neurodivergent like me you often have differences compared to others in how you communicate how you think and how you experience the world you are in that minority of people and when we think about who is in this group there's a whole bunch of people close to one in seven of us. So if you just take a look around and you try to guess one in seven people or so, that's an awful lot of us who might have some kind of difference in how we learn, how we process information, our cognition. And when we think about what those differences are, a lot of people tend to reduce this into three major categories, autism, ADHD, and learning disabilities whether it's a reading disability or like dyslexia, or it's a writing disability, or even a mathematics-related disability. I don't like to do that. When we put it in just those three categories, we really think often about people who are really good at doing things in the workforce or who might be an asset to somebody someday. We don't think about people who often face the most stigma, who have it the hardest, that we don't think a lot about our friends and loved ones and even colleagues and fellow students who might have something like Tourette syndrome, an intellectual disability, who struggle with our mental health and have something psychiatric like anxiety or depression or even acquired cognitive disabilities. That's the thing about disability and neurodiversity that's so interesting as well. It is the only minority group that you can join at any point in your life. A lot of us, if we are lucky enough to be alive for a very long time, might end up with an acquired cognitive disability, like Alzheimer's or dementia. It's just how the brain ages and how things work. Or you can acquire a form of neurodivergence through an accident or some other life-altering circumstances. I have a friend who was in a bad car accident a couple of years ago, and she ended up having a traumatic brain injury. And the way that she understands and processes language has fundamentally changed from that experience and that she ended up becoming neurodivergent because of that as compared to who she was prior to that accident. That's what makes neurodiversity so interesting to me. And when we think about neurodiversity, it's something that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have this idea that we look at disability, all forms of disability, as these scary, bad things. But when neurodiversity as a term first came about in the late 1990s, it was coined by a sociologist in Australia by the name of Judy Singer. And she was writing back and forth with a journalist from the Atlantic named Harvey Bloom. And when she was describing it to Bloom and he eventually wrote about it in the Atlantic, he ended up writing that neurodiversity may be every bit as crucial for the human race as biodiversity is for life in general. And who can say what form of wiring will prove best at any given moment? I really like this as an explanation of neurodiversity. One of the earliest explanations I got early on in life about my own autism was related to that of computers. This idea of a Mac versus a PC. And when we look at it that way, these two different pieces of technology, 
they both do the same thing. They're both computers, relatively speaking. They do very similar things, but their interfaces might look a little different. The software isn't always the same. And there are things that one is better at than the other, that there are things that my PC can do a lot better than my Mac can and vice versa. It doesn't mean that one is broken or one is incorrect for the way that it exists. It just means that it's different. And that can be one of the best things about it in any given situation or moment. There are things that compared to my neurotypical colleagues that I'm really good at. And then there are things that I am really, really terrible at. And that's just being human. That's what I've learned a lot as a neurodivergent person is that being human comes in many different forms and we all have our own strengths and weaknesses. The things that make us exactly who we are. That when we think about neurodivergence though, we don't think about our strengths. When we talk, talk about disability, we always focus on the deficits, the weaknesses. People usually expect me to tell you everything that is hard for me. People want to know about how I struggle to stay organized, to plan, to drive, to do many things that a lot of people in their 20s just somehow effortlessly seem to do. That's not necessarily the things that I want to focus on or even how it's difficult for me to make friends. I could tell you these types of stories all day long. I can share sometimes the heartbreak, the pain, the difficulties, the frustration of being an autistic and neurodivergent person. But that's not what I want to do. I don't want to just talk about everything that's hard for me because it doesn't tell you everything about me as a person. My strengths are the things that I want to celebrate. And so do so many other neurodivergent people. We don't often get the chance to celebrate what makes us who we are, the good things. Most of the time, it's all the struggle. How do we help this person, especially young people? Think about when you're in school. If you are a child with autism, ADHD, or a reading or learning disability, chances are you're getting pulled out of class. You're being viewed as disruptive, inattentive, spoiled, something else is going on, chances are. But really, you just process information differently. Maybe you're overwhelmed by the loud and crowded classroom. Maybe you need more time to get things done. But when we think about those strengths, we're thinking about how we can be really creative, that we might be thinking outside the box, that if there's something that we're really excited about, we might get really, really excited about it and know everything there is to know about it. That's partly why I love the law so much as an, as an attorney. I love that I can fall into something that I find interesting and research it and know everything and be an expert on something and it ends up helping other people. To me, that is one of the coolest things in the world. And the same goes for so many of my other friends and loved ones and colleagues who are also neurodivergent. One of the first people that I actually learned about in law once I started researching neurodiversity in my profession was a lawyer with dyslexia. And he ended up arguing at least one case that I'm aware of in front of the United States Supreme Court. He also said in numerous interviews that he can't read very well and that he would read and write very slowly. So what he would do is memorize everything he planned on sharing in front of the court. He was an incredible orator and lawyer for that. And when he was asked how he was so good at it, he would have to explain that he just couldn't read and he had no choice but to rely, that we have these other strengths, we adapt. We are indeed a pretty resilient bunch, come to think of it. And all of this sounds great, but we also face a ton of stigma that people don't always understand what it means to be neurodivergent or even just the things that we go through. People offer all sorts of unsolicited advice and comments that can be hurtful even if we don't think that they are. A lot of the things that people say to me are things like, why don't you just understand that? It's so easy. Anybody can do it. I always like to say that there are things in life that I couldn't figure out until much later on. There are things that most kids picked up pretty quickly when they were maybe five or six years old. I think a lot about tying your shoes that if you've ever worn sneakers or trainers, you can probably tie the little bow with the laces and you probably knew how to do that since you were young. I didn't figure that out until I was maybe 10 years old. 
And it was really, really hard for me. <laughs> but I know that's something that was unique to me. And that didn't mean that I wasn't good at other things. And there were things that my peers couldn't do that I was able to do. When I was six or seven, I was doing mathematics that were above grade level. I was doing things that were meant for the older kids because I didn't feel challenged by what was being assigned to me. I was doing other things. I was reading books above grade level because I love to read. And I was also kind of bored by what they were offering at the time. And even now there are things that my colleagues struggle with that I don't. And there are things that I struggle with that they don't think twice about. But probably one of the biggest things that people say is that they might've never known if I didn't share with you that I am neurodivergent or autistic. And this happens a lot. This happens a lot because we assume that there's a specific look to somebody with a disability that maybe you fit the stereotype. And typically the stereotype that we have in mind is always a child. We don't usually think of adults. We think of little kids who are usually really, really passionate about the sciences. We think about little boys perhaps who are obsessed with trains. That's one of the really big stereotypes in autism. We think of all sorts of things. We don't really think of girls. We don't think of women. We don't think of adults. We don't think of someone who is successful or that has ambition. We think of somebody who maybe is hiding out, living at home and not really doing anything, or that maybe we need to be supporting that much more. And while those do exist, that's not my story. And usually something else that happens is I work really hard and people don't always notice it. I work really hard to seem like I know what I'm doing socially a lot. <laughs> it is a lot easier for me to address the entire room today, both in person and online, than it is for me to possibly spend time with a group of maybe five or six of you. Most of you might have the opposite feeling where you'd rather sit with five or six of your friends then dare go on stage and address a group of people. I would much rather address the group of people because I feel very anxious and very unsure of what to do sometimes or would be having to use all these coping mechanisms and social strategies that I have learned over the years to survive that group of five or six people. But all of this really comes from this idea of ableism. And when we think about ableism, this might be something that's new to you too, but it really is rooted in these different biases, essentially, against people with disabilities. This idea that something is wrong with you, that you're broken, that you need to be fixed. And that's kind of the biggest thing that I've learned as time goes on, that neurodivergent people are not failed versions of normal. We're not broken. It reminds me a lot of what we talked about with the computers, that say your neurodivergent person is a Mac, and say your neurotypical person might be a PC. And you want me to run a specific app or program, and the coding just doesn't let that happen. You're probably going to just move on and say that's just how it is, or maybe you have some workaround or something else that we'd do instead. But when we think about this in terms of people, the same analogy, our first reaction is let's fix it. Something's broken here. While with our technology or something else, we might just move on. We might try to fix it, but not really realize that if it has a fundamental effect altering what the computer does normally or typically for that computer, we don't really think about that. And with people, we have to. It's so easy to feel like you don't belong. It's very easy to feel like it's a just hard to exist sometimes. And when we think about ableism, we're really thinking about how we're living in a world that's not equipped or designed with us in mind that it is devaluing and discriminating against people. But the thing that's really hard is it's really baked into our culture, that there's a lot of beliefs about what disability is or is not, how people learn to treat us. And when it comes to major decisions in life, that we're not often at the table making those decisions with everybody else. I like to think of this as something that we're trying to undo together. It's not always easy. And when we think about how ableism is just inside of our culture and the biases we have against neurodivergent and disabled people, it's really fascinating. One of the things that I always like to point out as one of my little things is I'm trying to stop saying the word crazy. And it's something that a lot of people do just naturally. Oh, how was your day? 
it was crazy. The craziest thing happened. That person over there, they were acting crazy. And I'm trying to stop doing this. Not because I want to expand my vocabulary, although that would be nice, but because crazy is something that can hurt people who struggle with their mental health. I have a friend who has bipolar disorder. She's also neurodivergent. And for her, crazy hits a nerve almost. It's something that's really difficult for her to hear because it's been used to dismiss every single time she has had a manic episode or a depressive episode or was just genuinely struggling with her mental health. I don't want to hurt my friend. That's how I like to look at it. And if all I have to do is come up with something different to describe my day or how somebody was acting, that's so easy in hindsight that all I have to do is say, it was a really busy day or this person was really ignorant. It's so simple just to make a couple changes that teach us how to treat people better. And when it comes to decision-making, people with disabilities, we're often just assumed that we're not capable of making decisions for ourselves or for others. But I want to be at the table, whether it's serving on a committee, whether it's planning an event, whether it's at work. A lot of times in disability rights, if you spent any time in an activism or disability rights space, there's this phrase, nothing about us without us. Think about if we made a lot of decisions on behalf of a group of people. Let's just say that group of people is all women. And let's just say all the people making decisions on behalf of these women are all men. They don't know what it is like to be a woman. They don't know what it is like to struggle with some of the things that we do. It just inherently feels like something might not be right there that you need that voice of experience making decisions and being at that table to talk about their experiences, how that might affect that group of people. Disability is the one place that happens a lot and it's assumed that we just don't belong and that the barriers to even get to sit at that table are immense, but they don't have to be. That's something that makes me really excited about our future and what we're doing as well. I'm kind of thinking through that a lot of this also comes down that we have to share our stories and sharing our stories is not always an easy decision to make. A lot of neurodivergent people, myself included, have to decide how much, when, or if we're even going to disclose to share this. And it's such a personal decision that varies from situation to situation. Even today, what I share with you is a choice that I have had to make. And what I share with my friends, my family, the people I work with, all of those are individual choices. And people might share very little, such as I'm autistic, and that's it. Some might share some details about that. So you know that I was diagnosed at three. You know that I am not very organized. You know that I struggle with certain things and I'm really good at other things. But some people might not say anything at all. And there's so many reasons that this happens that whether you're afraid of being viewed as less than or weak or undeserving, that there's this perception that you're being treated differently as I often had when I was working in a law firm that my colleagues often thought I received special treatment because everybody tried to be nice and accommodate me and offer me help I didn't want and I didn't need. So everyone just assumed I was kind of the favorite, which wasn't really true. I think everybody was just afraid because they've never worked with neurodivergent people before. There's also fears, not only about ableism, but how we internalize that kind of thinking through that maybe we're not deserving or other things. We're going to explain this a little bit more in a couple of minutes. And of course, there's fears with stereotypes, discrimination, and stigma. And if you are going into certain professions that do background checks or screen for mental health, as a lot of lawyers here in the United States often deal with, they're afraid that sharing might make it seem that they're not qualified to do their job to a licensing board or somebody else, or that it's unprofessional to be somebody with a disability when you're supposed to give the perception of being as non-disabled as possible, that you are truly fit and qualified to do the thing that you are doing. And the internalized ableism, the kind of thing that a lot of us struggle with is a mess, to be quite honest with you. I always say this is the mess that I haven't figured out how to get through. 
the mess that I haven't figured out how to get through is my own negative feelings that are based on the biases in our society. That whenever I need help, I'm always afraid to ask for it. And now I know as students and people in an academic environment that asking for help in collaboration is one of the greatest things that we have. That there are professors and mentors and fellow students who are always happy to lend a hand or to help you understand something or to maybe work with you so that you get it or get to that next step that you're hoping to get to. But for me, whenever I've needed help or an accommodation or literally anything, I was always afraid that I thought I was a burden. I was afraid I was asking for too much, that this person's going to think something is wrong with me. Or I'd think something like I'm just not good enough. And when I say the I'm not just not not good enough thing. What happened is I thought that I had to do everything. I had to be the most involved, the most qualified person in the room to be deserving of the same respect and opportunities as anybody else. I felt like I had to be superwoman. So you bet I joined every student organization. I joined nonprofit boards. I taught classes. I had the perfect internships. I did everything and then some, because it was the only way I would be able to get my foot in the door. While most non-disabled and non, most neurotypical people as well, just were able to get their foot in their door. They essentially had the luxury of being average. While I felt like I had to constantly prove that I was more than my autism, that I was somehow exceptional, that I somehow transcended disability, which is so unrealistic and a recipe for feeling exhausted and burned out. On top of that back of mind feeling that I might never work, I might never get a job because somebody won't believe in me. Because if you know anything about disability employment, you might know that people with disabilities are historically underrepresented. And for people with autism in particular, we have one of the highest unemployment rates of all disabilities. There's many, many reasons why that's the case, depending on where you're from depending on the biases and what support and accommodations are, are available to us. Often it's not nearly enough. But when it comes to that, and when it comes to sharing more, that people often feel that they have to share or they feel that they can volunteer to share. And people who feel that they have to share, at least in the States, we feel like you're able to get an accommodation under what's called the Americans with Disabilities Act, or if there's a similar law or a way that you're guaranteed to get accommodations. A lot of us also are trying to adapt and self-accommodate. We try our best to make sure that we don't have to ask for help sometimes, and all of a sudden, that just doesn't work. Or maybe the way that we communicate or achieve is no longer the same. If I don't sleep enough, for instance, I get kind of snappy. I am grumpy. I am not everybody's favorite person to be around, and I might not communicate the same way than if I rested or if, some, or if I'm depressed or unhappy. Or maybe I'm just not getting things done at the same pace. That when you notice that those things happening, it's not that somebody's just simply lazy. It could just be this person's mental health or that they can't just keep self-accommodating and adapting the way that they have been. And of course, life can change. A lot of folks discover they're neurodivergent later in life, perhaps because they didn't have access to a formal diagnosis earlier on. Or like my friend, or like those of us as we get older, end up acquiring a cognitive disability later in life. But those of us who are willing to share this information without really feeling forced to do so, might just take pride in who we are. I always want to be my full self. I take a take it or leave it approach. If you don't like me as a person, then that's not my fault. And if you can't accept the fact that I, I have a disability, that's also not my fault. I also like to be proactive. I miss something socially <laughs> almost every single day, that there's some invisible rule that I don't somehow know. People don't always mean what they say and they don't always say what they mean. And I'm usually confused. <laughs> so if people realize that I'm confused, they can help explain things to me or, or realize, you know, I know you're not being mean, when you're being really honest, but sometimes you're being honest to the point it can hurt somebody's feelings. And finally, I view neurodiversity one of my greatest strengths. I do not know what it is like to be neurotypical. I never will know. But 
I know I'm proud of the brain that I have and the life that I've been given. I am making the most of the situation. That is how I like to look at it. And that's all we're really doing is trying our best to thrive, to advocate for ourselves. And when we're advocating for ourselves, that's huge. When we advocate for ourselves, we're really making choices that affect our lives. They allow us to be independent. And when we think about who is advocating for ourselves, this idea of self-advocacy is a skill and a movement. We're really thinking of people with disabilities who are in charge of their own lives in some way, shape, or form. In fact, not even just people with disabilities, but every single one of us is a self-advocate, whether or not we know it. Think about how many times you're asked to make a choice. You all made a choice today to be here. You could have went to go hang out with your friends. You could have done something else. Or maybe someone you know was hosting a party. There was something else going on and you still chose to spend your time with me. For that, I am extremely grateful. But that's what advocating for yourself is. Is If your friend said, let's do something else, and you said, no, I am going to participate in the web and the Distinguished Lecture Series. That's a choice that you made. That's advocating for yourself. Yes and no are some of the biggest self-advocacy wins that we have. And when we advocate for ourselves, we're really taking control of our own lives and speaking for ourselves, and also sometimes with and on behalf of other people. It's one of the, the most powerful tools in our toolbox. And when we think about that, we're really kind of creating opportunities. We want people to feel safe. We want them to feel that it's okay to share who they are with us. And when we think about accommodations, whether it's for employers, employees, or anybody else in between, I never know the right way to do this. So something that I like to do is make it a conversation rather than I need something. I might say something like, I work best when I have clear instructions. Or if you do something really, really good and you didn't know it was helpful, I might say, it was really helpful when you sent everything in advance. That that might just be one way that I was able to say, you did something great, please do that again and say that that's something that I need in the future. Other things that we do is make decisions on who needs to know that we are neurodivergent, those kinds of pros and cons of disclosing. And when we work together and make these opportunities, we're able to advocate for not just ourselves, but others too. One of the very first places I worked actually had what was known as a fragrance-free policy. And at first I thought this was really strange. It was basically saying you were not allowed to wear perfume or cologne. And at first I didn't really know what to think of this, but I did learn that this was here because somebody previously had allergies. That's also why we didn't have flowers in the office. We didn't have all sorts of different things because we wanted to be accommodating. And it also took a lot of the guesswork out. And it's something that ended up helping everybody, not just the girl with allergies, but it also ended up helping people who were easily distracted when too much was in their sensory system because smells can be really distracting and overwhelming to some or to others, it could be really calming. Everybody had a very different take, but that was one time that I was able to see policy and advocating help everybody. That's the really cool thing about a lot of advocacy that it really does benefit as many people as possible. That's the thing that makes me really excited. And that kind of makes me think about where we're going next. And where we're going next is that strengths-based approach that we started talking about. When we're going to do strength-based, that makes me excited as we're focusing less on the things that are hard for us, the things we're bad at, the difficult side of disability and neurodivergence. But we're thinking about the things that we're good at. And just kind of a sampling of those things that I put up here are things like that where we might be really detail-oriented. We might be experts in our fields that typically when we think of young neurodivergent kids that are really obsessed with something or really excited about a specific interest, we have a tendency to think they're kind of weird. I don't really know why, but think about as we get older or even as we just progress, that we're experts in something. We know an awful lot about it. I know for those of us who are entering the sciences in very specific fields and even for our faculty here, they have so much expertise and in-depth knowledge on things that are probably pretty niche and pretty small in comparison to the world, or it just seems kind of interesting and unique. But we don't think that they're weird for it. We praise them for having this knowledge 
and skill set. The same should be for neurodivergent people who know so much about so many different things that there are people I can talk to and I can tell you all about maps or dinosaurs or ancient civilizations. There's just so much, depending on what makes them excited and passionate, that we might be really able to focus on something. And the character traits that often I get told are good things are the ones that I get in trouble for. I am usually one of the most honest people that folks know. That if you ask me for my opinion on something, I will tell you how I feel. Sometimes at the risk of hurting your feelings. And a lot of the times you might get told that that's rude or you're not supposed to say that. But I always thought, isn't honesty and loyalty and integrity something we value? And I wish that sometimes I got viewed and perceived more for being honest than something else. But the biggest thing for all neurodivergent people is we are existing in a society that doesn't always understand neurodiversity and certainly wasn't designed with that in mind. By that nature, we are forced to be creative, not just in the imagination and how we express ideas, but we have to adapt. We are a people that continues to survive. And we also are doing our best with what we're given to thrive in that world. It's taken creativity, especially even for me going through law school to survive that setting. My law school did not help me with all my accommodations, despite disclosing. Often, if not all the time, they actually denied me anything that I thought that I would need. Getting to survive it and still make it out and graduate and hopefully make things better for the next group of students, that takes creativity and resilience and so many other things that indeed are strength that we have. So what can we actually do? That's probably something we're thinking about during our time together too. And ways that we're able to be more inclusive of neurodiversity is really being open and vulnerable and honest with each other. We have to build trust. And when I think about what this looks like, I often reflect on the time that I also got to teach college and university students that I taught an autism related class to a bunch of psychology students. And on the first day of class, one student hands me a letter from the university's disability office to to implement their accommodations. And I don't think anything of it. Of course, I'm going to do it. Not only am I supposed to, but I want my classroom to be a welcoming place. And on the first day after that, I always ask folks why they took my class. I usually don't really care why they take it. I ask them this because I want to get to know them. I want them to get to know each other. Some kids say that they take it because they heard it was easy. Others took it because it will advance their career. But what happens in this particular instance is the student with the learning disability who handed me the form earlier in the day says, I took this class because like you, I also have a disability. And that really changed me. I thought a lot about it because this was someone who seemed almost embarrassed earlier in the day, afraid. And because I was open and honest with them and the whole class for that matter, they felt safe to do the exact same thing. It shouldn't just fall on young people or new people to have to be the ones being open and honest. It's something all of us can do. When I was perceived as an authority figure, it inspired other people to do the same. Other things we can do is go beyond the stereotypes of neurodiversity, of what we think people will be good at. A lot of the times it is really assumed that the thing that I'm going to be best at is technology. (laughs) Thankfully, here at KAUST, we have an amazing team that is making technology run smoothly and that I'm able to join you from across the world. That is not my strong suit. I love to read. I love to write. And in my first job, I kept getting assigned to do technology things. I was very nervous almost every single day. But when I finally got to read and write, I was so much happier. My work product was better. And I think I was just generally more pleasant to be around and to work alongside. That when we actually let people do the things that they're good at and that they want to do and then explore those passions, no matter how old they are or what it is, we genuinely have happier, more successful people and communicating with each other in a way that's direct and intentional. I always like to tell people, if you want to work and collaborate with me, 
I come up with a couple bullet points. I might tell you a couple things without really saying much more that you should keep in mind. I might tell you that phone calls make me anxious or that I'm not a morning person. Or you might say something like, don't talk to me until after I've had my first cup of coffee. It sounds kind of silly to put it that way, but there are many reasons that might be the case and things just to keep in mind. That way I know not to bother you too early to make sure you've had your coffee perhaps. Or maybe you just need that extra time because you have a family, because getting up just feels slow and painful. Everybody has their own reasons for who they are and they could share as much or as little as they want. But being direct about certain things goes an, an awful long way. And we also can do universal design, which is something that I'm a huge fan of, is that we design our environments to be accessible to everybody. The coolest thing about neurodiversity and disability to me is that it drives innovation. Now, a lot of you may or may not know about this, but you probably have used closed captions before. So when you have that those subtitles on TV programs or even when you're on social media or whatever that might be, and that's really great, right? So you probably might be aware of this, but closed captions were designed for people who are deaf or have a hearing impairment. And a lot of us who use this aren't deaf or hearing impaired. We probably use closed captions because we're learning a second language. We want to make sure we're getting what people are saying correctly. We just are somewhere very busy and can't have the sound on our phone or something else. But we all benefit from this. Even if we're not the intended user who is deaf, we're still benefiting that it's helped me when I do watch programs in other languages or just other things as well, that I'm like, oh, I can understand what's going on. That's one version of universal design, but there's so many more out there in ways that we can make things accessible to everybody. But one of the biggest things that I encourage us all to do is really grow in our neurodiverse mentorship and leadership. One of the coolest things that you're doing just by being here is that we're learning how to be better friends, better colleagues, better family members, to the neurodivergent people in our lives. And if you are neurodivergent yourself, hopefully there's something that resonates as well. But I always tell folks, if you know somebody or you are somebody, you have the potential to make their path have fewer obstacles in it. And great mentorship and leadership are those things. Every single one of us here has the potential to lead and to guide. And we learn and move forward because we're curious. We want to do the right thing. We want to help other people grow and to grow ourselves. So keep asking questions, keep learning and give us those opportunities because so often they're not even there. I regret that people didn't take the time to mentor me earlier in my career. I'm sad about that, that someone thought it might be too difficult. And there's so much I had to figure out by myself and it didn't have to be that way. So now I really try to go out of my way whenever I have the chance to be that person for somebody else. And I hope even now, and I'm lucky enough now that there are folks who do want to invest in my career and care about me and are willing to help guide me in some respect, I want to be able to pay that forward. And I hope that some of you have that too. Because here's the great thing about neurodiversity too. As Dr. Temple Grandin says, the world does need all kinds of minds and different kinds of minds working together. The future is an accessible, inclusive, and neurodiverse one. I'm awfully ready for that. And I hope you are too. So with that, I believe it is time to have some questions and I'm looking forward to getting to know you all a little bit better as well. Thank you, Haley. So for those in the room who want, we have the standing mics. For those who are PCs and for those that are Macs, we have the roving mic. So if anybody would like to take one, come uh, to the microphone and take, uh, ask your question, please. Thank you very much, Haley, for the talk. Um, I just want to hear your opinion about um, employers conducting mental uh, health screening tests prior to employing uh, potential employees. Do you think this is something is a part of matching the right minds with the right job? 
Or do you think this is something adding additional anxiety to people with mental illness? That's a great question. I actually think it's adding more anxiety and also depending on what country or what place you're living in, it can be discrimination. So the way that I look at it is there are certain jobs and certain things that it's, it might be necessary, but most of the time I think it is used to say somebody's not a fit for some reason or another, and it ends up harming everybody, that you miss out on somebody great perhaps because you have this bias that maybe if they're an anxious person that they're going to be shy or that they're unstable when really it's just the situation or that maybe they have a history of mental health issues, but it's being addressed right now and then you're still screening them out. So I personally am concerned that it is an extra obstacle that doesn't need to be there. Okay, thank you. Can we take the question from the left? Really insightful talk. Um, my first introduction to neurodivergence, I think, happened when I watched the show The Good Doctor, uh, where mm -hmm. the uh, lead uh, character is a surgeon who has autism and also savant syndrome. Um, how important do you think is the role of media in uh, educating the public on neurodivergence? And secondly, if you did watch the show, uh, did you have any particular pet peeves about something that happened on the show? Thank you. <laughs> I have not watched The Good Doctor because I have watched a lot of autism in media and a lot of those shows to me feel very, very similar that they usually focus on somebody who is a savant, quote unquote, and they usually are super socially impaired. And they're also usually written by and portrayed by neurotypical people. So a lot of the nuance is inaccurate and a lot of the times they feel kind of like a checklist. That being said, around the world, I do think that autism in media is a huge source of representation. I have found very few characters I personally did identify with who were written as autistic, but some of the ones I've identified the most with are characters who are not written explicitly as neurodivergent, but definitely feel like they're neurodivergent. So if you want some examples of that, if you are someone who watched Netflix in the last couple of months, there's a new show called Wednesday about Wednesday Adams. And Wednesday feels very neurodivergent to me. And just the way she's very blunt, she has a very flat affect, she's very invested in justice. And I think that's really cool. And a lot of the times that stuff comes across better, but there's also representation that has moved the needle forward as well. And I think about this on a global level. So one of my favorite new shows actually was Extraordinary Attorney Wu. It's out of South Korea and it's about an autistic attorney, which of course to me is super interesting because of my life experience, but people are very accepting of her. She's solving a lot of great cases and it feels really great to me because from what I understand is the landscape of how autism is talked about in South Korea is very different than it is perhaps here for me in the United States. So I also realize when we think about shows like The Good Doctor, I do often have a very American standpoint of we've seen this show before, whenever we talk about autistic people on TV, that they seem to follow this kind of checklist. But I am aware that around the world and in perhaps different places, it can be a lot more groundbreaking than I think it is. So. It really is in the eye of the viewer, but I do think some of the best representation has yet to come because we don't invest a lot in autistic and neurodivergent actors and screenwriters mm -hmm. and directors and creatives. And that's something I would love to see more of in the future. Okay. Thank you. So can we take a question from the roving mic? <laughs> Hi, Ellie. Thank you so much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. My name is Caterina, and I am a mom of a neurodivergent kid. My son is in the autism spectrum and is 12 years old. He's a big expert of cybersecurity and virtual reality. He's actually obsessed with it, and I'm very proud of it. I constantly tell to my son that his neurodivergency is a superpower, and I always encourage him to be his self-advocate and to be proud of who he is to take pride in his neurodivergency because I always tell him that neurotypical people really don't change the world. Neurodivergent people might do it. And mm -hmm. uh, also, I, I always tell him that the environment needs to adapt to his needs and needs to be inclusive. This is a must. He always yes. feels like he's asking for too much, as you were saying. 
and I always try to encourage him to keep asking for more. And I try to learn what he needs, what are his needs. And I encourage him to break his boundaries and to be in the uncomfortable zone as much as he can, because this is how he will grow, but also to be so confident in who he is and in his neurodivergency that he will never have to feel ashamed about it and to ask for what he needs. So my question for you as a mom is, uh, what would you say to your 12 years old self? Because this is what I would like to say to my son. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so first off, thank you so much for sharing your family story and about your son. And he sounds absolutely fantastic. And the way that you are talking about autism with him sounds a, a lot the way that my parents talked about it with me. My parents also described it like a superpower and taught me to also advocate for myself and try to make me get past my boundaries and feel uncomfortable, but also let me know that if that was too much that they were there for me, like there was always this safety net. So what I would probably want my 12 year old self to know is it's okay to try new things. You don't have to be perfect. Is I think there was so much pressure that I put on myself as a young person, especially to be perfect, to appear as normal as possible because I wanted to make friends. I was afraid of being bullied. I wanted to be accepted. And learning that I didn't have to put all that pressure on myself was huge. I'm still learning that actually, I'm currently 28 and I'm still learning to stop putting pressure on myself. But that's the thing I would really want 12 year old me to know is, hey, you don't have to be perfect. That perfection is not the goal. And learning how to be unapologetically yourself takes time and having people in your life that accept you will make all the difference. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about for 12 year old me. And also that's just a very complicated time in life because like your body is changing, people around you are changing. It's a very kind of transitional phase. So just be kind to yourself. That's the other thing I wish I had known and something I'm still learning today. And I think that so many neurodivergent people have to learn is, hey, it's not your fault. This is not something that's wrong with you. And the world is not always going to be as accepting and understanding as you would like it to be. But you are going to do the best that you can. Be kind to yourself. And don't forget to take some time to rest and celebrate who you are. That's totally okay and encouraged. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Haley, thank you very much for this talk. And I am so happy you accepted to come to WEB because this is often not a very much spoken topic. And also with our new child and learning development center at CAUS, I find it very meaningful. And thanks everyone joining today. Um, and, you know, during your talk, I don't know if I could describe myself ordinary or non-ordinary anymore. I resonated with almost all the things that you said as well and started thinking like, aren't we all neurodiverse anyways? And I think I think you know, we all have these kind of like social expectations of what is normal and a lot of us fall short of that. So yes, and, and I do kind of wonder what is normal quite a bit. So that's a really interesting point. Yeah, and maybe it's a bit of a philosophical discussion we can have with the crowd here. Um, because <laughs> I started to question, and it's a very naive question, sorry, maybe Paul or, and can intervene as well. Where is that line? You know, and honestly, in Cows, we are over 100 nations. And you being from US, you said you heard this thing in, when you were in high school, you know. Honestly, I heard it when I was 30 and above. I had no idea about this. And maybe some of us, like you say, are born with it, raised with it, and our families thought like that's that's how they are, you know, and not spoken. Yep. So, is it being diagnosed make you, you know? I'm just trying to help the people to realize themselves and self awareness. Is it like you need to be diagnosed to sp speak this out, or honestly, I will start walking around. I am neurodiverse from today onwards because it's, you know, it's it's a very philosophical discussion and a thought mm. how you feel yourself. I can understand some people who are at the other end of the spectrum with very hard um, disabilities, but 
for mm -hmm. some, I find that it's quite broad to, you know, def define themselves. And as a community, I don't think you need to be neurodiverse to be welcoming. And I heard from your talk a lot like empathy, communication, mm -hmm. right, uh, self-advocacy, uh, awareness, as I said, to, to work with others in just in a happier place. Um, so yeah, so where, where that line is basically is just my question. Actually. I love I love this question because it's something I think about a lot. There's kind of this debate in the neurodivergent community about who gets to identify. And I come from the camp of if you realize that a lot of these traits of most neurodivergent conditions are something that matches your brain, you probably are neurodivergent and you don't need a diagnosis to tell you that. A lot of people who are adults get diagnoses primarily because they need access to services or accommodations or something like that. And you might not be able to get it otherwise. But I do look at self-diagnosis or self-identification as valid because sometimes getting access to a good psychologist, for instance, can cost a lot of money. Or there's somebody who's not very well versed in how autism or ADHD presents in women, for instance, that there's a lot to kind of consider there. So I look at it from a justice perspective of if you identify, and this is something that is part of your, your self-discovery, then go for it. But if you do need more serious services, definitely get a diagnosis. And I usually think about diagnoses a lot more for young people because there's so many more services you can get while you're still in primary school or going to high school or entering the university community that there's a lot more that's out there for you when you're younger, but it's really kind of a can of worms there. And as for where that line is on neurodiverse and neurotypical, I'm not really sure because the more I think about it, the more I don't know if neurotypical actually exists because like I said, these kind of societal standards, everybody falls short at some point. It's just that is it, does it sometimes rise to the level of that it's actually disabling in your life is always where I kind of draw that line personally, is that I might say that I'm very disorganized, which I am. And a lot of you are probably also very disorganized. But if it hits a point that being so disorganized makes it that other things in your life are more difficult or it's actually disabling in some way, shape or form, then it might be a trait that's symptomatic of something else. That's kind of where I like to take that. But I also look at disability as this thing that's both very hardline and also very social. Hmm. That when we think of things that are disabilities that obviously affect somebody's quality of life, we think of things, you know, like if they're able to walk, if they're able to think, if they have intellect, we're thinking about all of the learning, all of these things that we can usually pinpoint pretty easily. But then there are things that are socially disabling, which is something I've been playing around with a little bit too, that it doesn't rise to the level of a disability, but because of the circumstances of our society, it absolutely is. So when I talk about social disability, I usually talk about being left-handed because I'm a lefty and most of the world is designed for right-handed people. Now, there's nothing actually wrong with you or disabling in itself as a condition about being a left-handed person. But if you look at the way that rooms and desks are configured, the way that if you use a pen and you're left-handed, like your entire hand smudges, if you write from left to right, that there's lots of little things that are a lot harder for no other reason, sports, because you're left-handed. So I look at that as kind of socially disabling, but figuring out that line, like you said, is a very interesting philosophical debate, mm. but it's really in interesting. And there's a lot on disability theory as well. That would be a fun discussion to have on this too. Like there's these ideas of medical model of disability, that the disability is something to be fixed. It's a problem with the person. And then there's the social model of disability of, well, you know, that's not entirely the case, but society makes it much more harder to exist in that there's issues with the environment, people's attitudes, et cetera, et cetera. So definitely something we can spend the rest of the day probably talking about. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for that answer, Haley. I'm conscious of our time, so maybe if we take one kind of comment from online and then we can finish with one um, question from the person who's standing there. So this person just mentioned, as a person, it's a comment, so as a person with ADHD, I've often had to take some sort of cognitive ability test, probably by someone like me, a psychologist, when they're applying for a job, and typically in big companies, I struggled a lot with the memory-based tasks, and I've genuinely felt that it was a way to discriminate. So just a comment in general about assessment um, and whether, as Haley said, it leads to additional services or actually the lack of, uh, of opportunities, which is an important point to consider. Maybe we could finish with one final question. Um, can we take it from the person on the left? So are all, oh, okay. Thank you so much, Haley, and please feel free not to answer the question due to time constraints. But uh, as a person with who felt like pressure being imposed on because uh, inside you were feeling unable to join somewhere so you had to do extra. I think that applies to not just neurodivergent people but also minority in general who are imposing mm -hmm. a lot of pressure upon themselves to be somewhere or to feel average. Uh, as an employer or in the future a figure of authority, what is something that you would do to ease it for the younger generation or the people who are still looking for places for themselves in the world? Something you wish was done or said to you to give you mental easiness in the process? Thank you. That's a great question. And I think you're definitely right when you're talking about how this is something that a lot of minorities have to do or they feel that they have to do in some way, whether it's gender, race, religion, et cetera. But if I had the choice, I wish I could, when people say be yourself and you could bring your full self, that they actually meant it. Because a lot of people say these things, but it's not always true that they want you to be your full self and then they treat you differently for it. So I wish people actually meant what they said. And inclusion is a practice. It takes time. It's not an exact science. It's not perfect. So that's something I would like to see. But when it comes to hiring for jobs, one of the biggest things that kind of really gets me is the way that interviewing is done is a way that ends up kind of harming people who aren't very social or who struggle with answering questions without having time to think about what they want to say, that I wish we gave people more of an opportunity to show what they're good at rather than just expect them to be good at answering questions. I know for me, I like to think things through, which is even why doing Q&A at the end of here is a little anxiety inducing because I don't know what to expect. And I have to think really quickly to give a good answer. So I wish that sometimes we didn't always have that situation, especially with jobs, because it's really scary if you've ever sat in front of a couple of people interviewing you or asking you about your qualifications and you don't know what they're going to say, because I've had people ask questions like, oh, how would you make a sandwich? And I'm like, what? I am applying to be an attorney. And apparently they're trying to see how creative you are, but it has nothing to do with my job or the job that I want, and I just feel very stressed about it. So those are a couple things I would do differently. I feel like there's a whole lot that needs to change, but those are some of the things that really just frustrate me. Have we time for one more question? Haley, is that okay? We've got somebody who's yeah, been well, waiting for about five minutes, so okay. thank you. I'm sorry you've taken so much of your time, but I want to ask you one more question. So as the main idea of this lecture is to understand why our conversations around uh, neurodiversity so difficult, uh, do you feel people are obligated to clarify that they are neurodivergent? I think that that's a personal decision for folks. So if people want to share that they are, they can. And, but I don't think it's up to us to figure out who is, who isn't, and to force people to share information if they don't feel comfortable. I feel very comfortable talking about my own autism and neurodiversity journey, but I know not everybody else does, and that's totally okay. That's what makes us human, but I would like us as a group, I think we're more obligated to create this sense of safety that makes it safe if people want to without being afraid that they're going to be judged or treated differently or being excluded. That's more of the goal, if you ask me. Thank you. 
So I just we come to the very end now, so it's just up to me to thank everybody for turning up. Thank you for your presence, for your consistency in, in remaining here. I know that there was a lot of interesting questions, and in a very special way, we wanted to thank our distinguished lecturer talk today, who inspired us, who talked about nothing about us without us, who talked about the importance of thinking that disability is not something that people are successful in spite of, but because of, and has opened a new understanding of what exactly neurodiversity is. And we hope that we can continue this link with yourself. And um, Haley, I know you've written four books. I haven't, I still have to read one of them, but I have downloaded one of them. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And I've also followed you on your website. So we hope that we can continue a link with you as you continue to inspire us. Thank you so much for your time, for being present, and for sharing your insights with us tonight. Absolutely. And thank you all for taking the time to learn with me and to be here. And I hope that we can keep this conversation going. If you want to stay in touch, you're more than welcome to reach out to me online or on social media. And I'm looking forward to getting to know everyone better and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.